Okay, great. Um, so um, thank you for your interest in joining today's webinar on careers in the NGOs and the international organization sector. So I'm Professor May Chu from the Data Science and Policy Studies Program in the Faculty of Social Science. So in this webinar, we are honored to have four guest speakers to share with us their work experience in the sector. And they will introduce you the job nature and required skills to work in the NGOs and international organization sector. And they will also offer you some useful advice on how to path your way for developing careers in the sector. So first of all, we will have Ms. Jo Hayes, CEO of Habitat for Humanity Hong Kong as the first speaker. Habitat is an international NGO with a vision of a world where everyone has a decent place to live. And Joe's career path spans a range of industries from education and media production with the British Council and BBC Worldwide to the NGO sector. And Joe brings over 20 years of experience and expertise in strategy development operational management and multi-stakeholder engagement. So now let's welcome Zhou. Thank you so much, May. I, I feel really old now. I realize I've got a number of years behind me, a number of industries. Um, shall, I, shall I go ahead and share my screen? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, let me get that. And thank you so much for, for the opportunity to, to join you all today. It's amazing. I can see we've, we've got just under 100 people um, on the call. I'm admitting people as as I see them pop up because I've got co-hosting, so I'm uh, admitting the right people to, to, to join today. But um, but yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to, to be with you. And I'm always excited to, to share about what it means to be working in the in the nonprofit sector. Um, um, but I will actually give it a different name. Uh, this evening, I won't be calling it the nonprofit sector. Um, so, yeah, as May as May shared, um, I'm the CEO of Habitat for Humanity Hong Kong, and my name is Joe Hayes. Um, I do have a bit of a colourful career that um, that's crossed over multiple industries, and and I have got a very strong editorial background that crosses over a few of my positions. So, I did want to make it really clear that what you can see on the screen here is is not a is not a typo um, i did <laughs> i did mean to cross out nonprofits and put for impact um, i think too often in the in the nonprofit sector we talk about what we are not and what we don't do and the sector is actually defined by not making a profit but i heard this term uh, for impact organization um, in a workshop that I attended um, a couple of weeks ago from the Asian Charity Services by uh, Lali Kesby, who's a board director at the nonprofit that I used to work at. Um, and I think it's a term that we should all start to use. Um, so I'll be using for impact organization in this presentation when I'm referring to nonprofits. So I only have, um, I only have 20 minutes. So um, I'll really I'll cover the essentials, um, and uh, I'm going to talk about very briefly why why is get data gathering and impact measurement so important for each and every one of us, not just for the for impact sector. Uh, why we do what we do at Habitat, how we do it, what it is that we actually do. Um, and then I'll touch on the importance of defining your purpose and values and what a career in the sector can actually look like. So before I start about the importance of, uh, of data and impact, uh, I'm going to share why we do what we do at Habitat for Humanity. And I'm sure you've all heard of Simon Sinek. Sinek. And if you haven't, look him up. Um, his fam he famously talks about always starting with the why. So that's what we're going to do today. So as May mentioned, uh, we do have a vision. Um, it's a global vision um, and one that we also have in, in Hong Kong as well. And we're driven by the vision that everyone, every single person deserves a decent place to live. Habitat 
for Humanity has grown from a grassroots effort in the in the United States, uh, founded in 1976, um, to what we are now as a global housing organization um, in over 70 countries. 1.6 billion people around the world live in substandard housing. That's the why. Hong Kong is ranked as one of the world's most expensive cities to live in, and with 20% of the population living below the poverty line, COVID has exacerbated the needs of the most vulnerable groups in Hong Kong. And the pandemic has exposed the extreme inequalities in the housing market. It's not just a public health emergency, it's also a housing emergency. And home is the first line of defense against the virus. Our local work in Hong Kong contributes to the 5.9 million people served globally over the last year by Habitat. Since we were founded uh, back in 1976, we've served over 35 million people and helped them to build or improve their home. And these are, these are big numbers, and, but we can never ever forget that each of these numbers um, represents a person. Um, represents a person whose life is positively impacted. So data matters and measuring impact is, is really critical to ensure that you're making a sustainable impact in the world and, and making a difference. Um, and I'm proud to share that, um, that recently in the Hong Kong team, um, I created a new role for us um, and it's called Impact and Sustainability Manager. Um, it's the job title is really important because it symbolizes um, how we as an organization are ensuring that we put both financial and programmatic sustainability um, into the core of our decision making and that impact is right in the center of that. So why are numbers and data so important? Well, we've got goals we want to reach, we've got direction, we have a vision, and we're ra raising awareness, as many other organizations are, of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, for us in particular, it's um, SDG 11, uh, that's the, the natural fit, although um, so many of these um, SDGs are related to housing as, as the core of foundation of, of so many. Um, but um, what you can see on the screen here is taken from an organization called Our World in Data. Um, and I think it's a particularly interesting look at the SDGs because what they've done in this um, in this exercise, it, they've identified what data is available around the world. They've broken down the UN targets that you can see, and they've provided indicators and the related data that is needed to track progress against the SDGs um, as we work towards that um, 2030 global goal. So how do we work towards our vision? We have a global strategy, as I mentioned, and this, um, no surprise um, that this covers three houses. We have a visual of three houses. We're a housing organization. It makes sense to us. Um, but it, it breaks down in very three very um, understandable houses. Um, first of all, for house one, that's around building community impact. That's, we're talking about our programs, and our direct work with all of our beneficiaries. I'm going to jump quickly to, to house three. Uh, that's about building societal impact. And this refers to inspiring action for change in the community and building a global network of volunteers and advocates for housing solutions. So back to house number two um, and the arrow there that's pointing to that picture that was actually taken last week. Um, house number two is, is building societal uh, impact sorry, building sector impact. Um, we actually started our house two journey two years ago in Hong Kong. We didn't really do so much with house two before around sector impact, um, but really it's talking about promoting policies and um, regulations and systems that advance access to adequate and affordable housing. And earlier this year, the government set up a task force for the study on tenancy control of subdivided units. Last week, as I mentioned, uh, they invited us to, um, to attend their, their, their meeting and, um, and share some insights for some, from some creative ideas from around the world 
but could potentially um, help their thought process and their own creative thinking to find solutions for tenancy control of subdivided units in Hong Kong. One of the key messages um, that we shared with them uh, was around a, a, um, a campaign in South Africa called Know Your Community. And we shared that to know your solutions, you must know your people. And to know your people, you have to gather data. Gathering data is key to success. Um, and then I important, really important to, to note, um, and I haven't put it here um, visually on the slides, but underpinning those three houses are the foundations to our organization. Um, and they cover two areas. One is being financially sustainable. Um, but the, the second is really, really key, and that's investing in our people. We can't do what we do without our people. So what else do we do in uh, a habitat? We build houses. We build houses around the world and as the most disaster prone region, we work with communities to enable them to be resilient against future disasters. We deliver skills training such as financial literacy and masonry skills so that people and, and importantly women can learn how to build their own homes and even use their new skills to generate future income. We, we engage with millions of volunteers to become advocates for decent and affordable housing for all. In Hong Kong, we carry out essential home repair and renovation work in, in public housing estates. And in response to an emerging need um, as part of our Project Homeworks program, which is our local um, home repair and renovation program, we've developed a, a, a deep cleaning strand um, and it, but it, it addresses both the needs of the elderly for keeping their homes clean and healthy, um, as well as providing employment opportunities for local domestic workers who've seen their income significantly reduced because of COVID. We, we usually help around uh, 200 families a year in, um, in Hong Kong, but this year, we're helping over 1,000 families. I'll just let that settle. Going from 200 a year to 1,000 um, in, in nearly half a year, um, it's really important to note that the need is greater than, than ever, even though the challenges are immense. So what about you? What's your purpose and, and do you want to make a difference in the world? There are a few misconceptions about the charitable sector. When I first joined the sector, uh, the first question that I was asked was always, um, oh, is that a full-time job? Um, which used to get me really irritated. Um, but I understand it a bit more now and I accept it. Um, but my response is always, it's actually more like two full-time jobs. It's hard work, um, but it's so rewarding. Uh, Joe, you have to unmute. Yes. Oops, how did that happen? <laughs> Maybe you clicked the wrong button. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, was I talking about how much hard work it was to be in the sector? When I got to that <laughs> Yeah, so um, the misconceptions are it is hard um, and it is a full time job. And, um, and whenever I've been asked that question, I always do say it's, it's more like uh, two full time jobs because you never really switch off. You, you, are, you are purpose driven um, when you join the sector. Um, and so you're always thinking about how to, to help other people and, and help to make their lives better. Um, it's hard work, but very, very rewarding. And, um, and there's a misconception that you know, we're really badly paid. Don't get me wrong, we, we don't have a great salary, but we're certainly not um, the, the one of the worst paid industries. We do have some decent salaries within the industry um, because quite frankly, the work that we do is so important. We need skilled people, we really do. Um, 
the range of roles is massive. Um, it's not just frontline work, although that is, uh, that's a huge um, section of what we do, but there's so many other roles um, that you could go into. Um, and I'm gonna repeat on that last point that the program about the programs run themselves. The programs do not run themselves. Um, we do need skilled people. Um, I don't seem to be able to, oh, there we go. Um, so here are just a few examples of the type of roles that you can hope to have in a four impact organization. Uh, can you spot the odd one out? Yeah. Give you a few seconds. Actually, it is not the odd one out. This is a natural, I was having a look on a UK uh, charity jobs, UK website um, a few days ago. This is an actual job, a puppy coordinator, which I think sounds amazing. Um, but what I was actually trying to, to sort of demonstrate here is that, you know, non-profits or for-profit organizations, as with any um, organization in any industry, we need specialists in HR, we need finance specialists, we need project managers operations experts, we definitely need um, specialists in data analysis and research, and the list goes on. So how do you know um, what your purpose is? And how do you find out if an organisation has the same values as you? Well, in multiple ways, you, know, you can volunteer your time, your expertise, you can develop your leadership skills through organizations such as ours. We, we, we take people on to become volunteer team leaders um, to help us run our programs. Um, you can find internships that give you an opportunity to contribute in a, in a valuable way. Um, at, at Habitat, we always try and make sure that it's about impactful projects and not photocopying. Um, and it's really important that, you know, with internships that you, you remain in connection with your, in contact with your, with your organisations. We've just today um, offered a, um, a, a position to somebody who interned with us two years ago, and their report was a research report on um, advocacy and, and local housing policies. So I'm not just saying this, this actually is how you can lead into a, into a future position with an organization that has the same values as you. And don't be afraid to ask the organization, what are their values? Um, some, you know, the range of organizations is huge. So how do they treat their people? Um, is, it a, is it a clock in and clock out mentality? Or do they value trust and transparency? Especially in times of COVID, um, there are also more opportunities for short-term contracts. So you can learn about different causes and develop a sense of what your purpose might be through, through working with different organisations. Um, but I strongly encourage you to avoid the temptation of job hopping. The data around how often people move from one organisation to the other and how quickly they move from one organisation to another, that data is definitely out there. But when you, when you commit to a cause and when you commit to an organization, you have so many opportunities to, to grow with that organization and to help that organization to grow. So often you can get involved with different teams and, and learn with and alongside your, your colleagues. You can develop your skill sets in multiple areas and the leadership opportunities are plentiful. Working for a four impact organization can be a stepping stone to a corporate job. But for so many people, it can be a meaningful and purpose driven destination. Certainly was for me. Thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to, to having a, a more interactive chat later on with the, with the Q&A. But for now, I'll. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay. I'll just give you a moment for my email if you want. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for your sharing.
Um, so we will have the Q&A session at the end of all the talks. So if you have any questions, please wait for a while. Um, now we will have Ms. Queenie Law as our second speaker. And Queenie is the former Gender and Social Inclusion Support Officer, UN Volunteer of the United Nations Development Program in the Lao People's Democratic Republic. Her work in the UN program includes project development and management, research and resources mobilization for poverty reduction, gender monitoring and lobbying with local partners for better COVID-19 crisis response. Quinny is also a recent CUHK alumna, and now she is studying in a master program in peace and conflict studies at Uppsala University in Sweden. Let's welcome Quinny. Thank you, May. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. Sure. And wait. And let's do this. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much for having me here today. Um, it's definitely my, my honor to be one of the speakers and I hope you're all keeping well during this difficult period of time. So as you can see from the title, I'll be focusing on a career in INGOs or international organizations like the UN. So I guess I'll start by telling you a little bit more about myself. So I'm a recent graduate from CHK. I graduate with a bachelor in government and public administration back in 2019. And right after my graduation, I went to Laos and I served with UNDP for one year. And my position as May mentioned was gender and social inclusion support officer. So the reason why I did this right after my graduation is because I've always had a strong interest in international affairs, in development, and especially gender equality and women's empowerment. So back in CHK, I did focus my studies in international relations and gender studies. So you can see I already have quite a strong, strongly established interest, and therefore working in uh, the UN is quite like a logical step for me that I would take. And currently, I'm now in Sweden, actually, so I'm still studying my master's in peace and conflict studies. So before I move on to my presentation, I'd like to add a little more like general note. So as you can see from my profile, I'm also uh, like a fresh graduate. I'm still exploring my career ambition. I'm also expanding my network. So what I'm hoping to do here today is to share with you my experience from the past one year with the UN and what I've learned about the INGO sector. But I'm also hoping to hear from you, to discuss with you, and also most importantly, to learn from you all as well. So, I'll start with the most frequently asked question, which is how I got in. So I understand that for many people working in the UN sounds like a far-fetched concept and doing it right after your graduation is also quite rare. So if you're a university student in Hong Kong, um, we're actually very lucky. So I'm not sure if you've heard of the Hong Kong Agency for Volunteer Service, AVS, you can search it on Google, and also UNV, UN Volunteer, it is a UN agency. So basically the concept is that the Hong Kong, so the AVS in Hong Kong, they are like government funded. And the idea is that the Hong Kong government will fund a batch of university students in Hong Kong to go to different countries and work in different UN agencies. So for me, I'm batch five, and we have countries like Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, and also Sri Lanka in initially, but there was like a terror attack right before the departure of the volunteers. So they canceled the, the posting there. But then different university students, they go to um, like UNICEF, FAO, for me it's UNDP. So different UN organizations. And then during my time in Laos, I do, I do receive like living allowances. So, but then it is, funded by the Hong Kong government, but through the UNV, if, if it makes sense. So you will have to, if you apply for the program, you will have to go through three rounds of interview. So first of all is uh, the shortlisting by CHK. So if you're CHK, CHK students, you apply through CHK, and then uh, the, the university will shortlist around 10 people, and then they will give you to your names to the Hong Kong government round. And then after you go for the Hong Kong government like interview, and then you go to the UN agency that you're applying to. So three rounds of interview. I got my result back in January. So like for the second semester of my last year, I'm already pretty set. So that was pretty nice. Um, so 
What exactly did I do during my year with UNDP? So giving you a little bit of background about Laos, if you have not heard of Laos. Laos is a Southeast Asian country. They, uh, it neighbors Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, and China. And it has been classified as one of the least developed countries in the world. It is a Buddhist country and it used to be a French colony. So as you can see in the photo on the top right-hand corner, this is called the Petusai Monument, and it kind of resembles the Arc de Triomphe Monument in, in Paris because they integrated both the Oriental and Western element. So the top kind of looks like the tip of the temple, but then the body kind of resembles like a Western architecture. So it kind of represents the mix of culture in Laos as well. Um, the UN in Laos, we mainly support uh, the localization of the 17 SDGs, especially in integrating them in the national development planning. Um, fighting poverty and ensuring basic rights is a high priority because um, almost a quarter of the Lao population live in poverty and estimated of 80% of the country lives on less than $2.5 a day. So in many, many rural areas, many people lack road, they lack water and electricity. So uh, fighting poverty is something uh, of high priority. And Laos is also an ethnically diverse country. We have 51 official ethnic groups and they all speak different dialects. So ensuring equal participation of all individuals in the national developing, development process is also of high priority. So during my year there, I was under the governance and poverty reduction unit. So I would say there are three main type of tasks. The first one is project management. We have around three to four po projects under each unit, the governance unit and poverty reduction unit. In terms of the governance unit, we have projects that build the provincial governance capacity and enhance the basic service delivery, like uh, birth registration or like uh, marriage registration, those kind of like basic services. And we also have rule of law project that assist the judiciary sector in refining the legal system and also enhance the access to justice for all individuals. Um, for poverty reduction, we have projects that focus on youth employment, some on vocational training for women, and one is about promoting Lao products to overseas markets. So project management basically would mean overseeing the operation of all these projects, liaising with local partners, organizing events and activity according to the project document. I would say this task is more about coordination because all our projects, we work with so many actors in the country. And it is also a more technical one. So it involves like budgeting, it involves a lot of writing and research and uh, like just going to meetings, consultations, stuff like that. Um, the second main task will be project development. It refers to developing proposals and contacting the potential donors that can fund these proposals. Um, I have developed proposals on eliminating gender-based violence against women by strengthening the national governance mechanism and the legal framework. I've also developed a number of proposals focusing on the rule of law, on youth empowerment, and etc. So when we develop these proposals, we have to do a lot of policy research. Um, we have to know what the current situation is like. We have to know what the problem is, who are our target audience, which province do we want to launch our project? Are there any other NGOs doing similar work so we can initiate a collaboration with? How is the policy environment looking like? What is the government doing about the problem? So all these questions have to be answered before you actually design your project. So a lot of hard work has to be done, especially me as a foreigner to Laos. I don't know the language. I have to give you know, extra effort to, to do the research and to talk to people to do consultation. So to form an actually evidence-based program that actually address the problem. So this is like the second main task. And the third main area of my work is about gender equality. So I am the gender focal point for the country office. So basically anything about gender equality would go to me. And it is also the UN's policy that all projects, even though it's not dedicated to the cause of gender equality, should have gender embedded in the project design and con contribute to gender equality in some ways. So I was taught to monitor, monitor and evaluate all the projects under UNDP Laos and see where we stand in terms of gender mainstreaming, what we've done well, what we have not, and then how can we improve it? So this is a more research and m and &E work. And then during the International Women's Day this year, I was also in charge of a social media campaign. 
and I wrote articles about one of our projects and I was also invited by the UNV office to write a blog post sharing my experience in working about in the UN about gender equality issues. So both the article and blog post can be found online. So if you want to take a look and have a more concrete idea of what I've done, so you can you can also search for that. It's also in my LinkedIn, just, just so you know. Um, so during COVID, um, back in March and April, I was still in Laos actually. And then I was part of the crisis response team. So Laos was doing fine uh, regarding COVID and there wasn't like any community transmission, anything like that. But the issue is the economic and social impact of the lockdown and the travel restrictions. And it was fatal to a lot of industries. For example, because of lockdown, we see an increase in domestic violence in, in the household. And then because of like the travel restrictions, the entire total tourism sector is suffering basically. So as part of the crisis response team, we sat together and then in a very short period of time, we have to produce different proposals on like social protection, on SME support, on the national and provincial health preparedness in case there is a second wave of Corona, on tourism sector relief, on e-commerce. And then we have to present immediately to different donors or to our regional office to get the funding to actually launch these projects. It was a very intense period of time. Usually, for example, when I was saying like we do project development, it can take up to like three months to actually research and develop a project. But then imagine all that is squeezed into like one or two weeks because it is a crisis, it's a pandemic and we have to move quickly. So it was it was a very intense period of time, but then it was also the period I think I, I improved the most to, to learn to be, uh, to be sharp, to be decisive and to, to make things work. Um, so this is like an overview of what I've done in the past one year in Laos. And I think in a more general term, INGO or international organizations like the UN work on a more so-called high level kind of issues. For instance, we work on national policies. We assist the government in terms of the legal framework. We have a long established relationship with national governments and we are also a trusted partner by the government. So therefore we kind of act like an advisor to the government. But of course we do launch local level kind of projects. So I would say it's a good mix of the two different levels of work. So now I will um, zoom out a little bit to give you a, like a broader uh, perspective of the INGO sector. And I think there are some points I've observed and maybe it will be useful for you to know as well. So first of all is that there are a lot of options out there. When we're talking about INGOs, when we're talking about international organizations, the first one that springs to your mind is always like the UN, the World Bank, uh, Asia Devel Asian Development Bank, these like big organization. But in fact, there are so much more interesting organizations out there. There are think tanks and they're doing interesting things as well. So don't limit yourself to only like the renowned institution only. I think as fresh graduates, one common problem is that we don't even know what options we have out there. So I think one very important attitude is to be open-minded to all kinds of opportunity and keep exploring. And secondly, it is also important to know that the sector is very competitive. For example, if you're a lawyer, you are competing with lawyers from the same country or people um, share who share the same legal system at best. But to work in INGO, the nature of the internationalized institution also means that you have to compete with people from all around the world. So, um, and for a lot of like entry level work, they require a master degree. So I was very lucky to have got in the system with a bachelor only because of the UNV and the AVS program and that I can have a taste of how it's like to work in the UN. But bear in mind that the sector is very competitive in nature and the entry requirement is high as well. And then thirdly is the debate about the specialist or the generalist. I, of course, I think one should possess the quality of both, but I did observe a trend that they start hiring more specialists. For instance, like a country like Laos, they always have flooding in the south during the rainy season or the droughts in the north at the same time. So we need someone who has expertise in disaster management, and it is probably not something that a generalist can learn on the job. So yeah, and also there is like a trend of evidence-based policy making. So if you have a skills in data collection, in data analysis, and making informed evidence-based policy choice is highly preferred. So 
for students in the data science and policy studies program, congratulations, you made a great decision because it, it is something that I have observed these organizations really highly value. So if you have that, it gives you a great advantage on your CV. And all, I mean, it's important, it's important to possess quality of a generalist that you're flexible and you have basic knowledge about different issues, but having something that is your expertise, that's something you're good at is also a big plus. And the fourth point is the fourth point is a more general one. If you work in INGOs, be prepared for a rather unstable life, if I put it that way. Um, there is an unwritten rule that you usually don't stay in one country for more than four years. So be prepared to be moving in different places very often. For four years, in, you're in Southeast Asia and you move to Africa for like five years and then you move to, to like the New York to headquarter and then you go back to the field. So moving is very often and it's very common in the field. It really depends on you. Some people love it. Some people love to travel to different places, places to you know, have different cultures, but some some people struggle a lot because you, you just establish like a social circle and then you move to somewhere else. So you, you can feel quite detached. So it really depends on you. And a lot of job is also contract based, some six months, some one year with no guarantee of extension. It is not like a career in like a big corporate that, oh, I, I'm now in and then I can have a very you know, clear career ladder is not like that. So it's, it's quite unstable, I would say. And lastly, is just a more general point about being a fresh graduate. Um, be open-minded and be prepared to do all kinds of things. Of course, by all kinds of things, I'm not saying that, oh, if, you, if they ask you to make a coffee for them and do photo, like photocopying, it is, there's obviously something wrong. But by all kinds of things, I mean, as like a junior level staff, you have to be pre prepared that they give you a wide variety of tasks, some project management, some proposal writing, some lobbying, some budgeting, some procurement, some communications, human resources, anything. So my advice is just do it. And some, some might be boring. I really don't like human resources and HR work, but then it is something that you have to learn about so you know how the organization as a whole work and then it somehow benefits you as well. And um, lastly, I, I'll conclude with some tips on how to equip yourself for the field. The first tip is keep researching. As I mentioned just now, there are so many interesting opportunities out there waiting for you to discover. Um, Google is your best friend. So take some time to do some research about what organizations are doing things out there. Use LinkedIn, connect with people who are working in the organization that you're interested in, ask about their opinion and yeah, and how you can get in, for example, ask, ask how you can work with those organizations as an intern, as a trainee, as a junior level staff, whatever. So do your research, go, go out there and do your, do your networking. Um, the second point is also linked um, to what I've mentioned is to try to find an area that you want to be specialized in. For example, I've always had an interest in armed conflict in war, and I want to be an expert in peace building and development. And one of my career goals is to work in like post-conflict region. So that's why I'm doing a master's in peace and conflict studies right now. So if you found uh, your interest area, become an expert in it, but also of course be open to other perspectives. So you possess both the qualities of specialist and the generalist. Um, the last point is about language. If you want to work in a specific region like Latin America, then learn Spanish. If it's the Middle East, then learn Arabic. If you want to learn like to work in headquarters like in Geneva or some African countries, then learn French. Or for Central European countries, learn Russia, Russian. Um, depend on where your interest is in, having an additional language skill will be a big plus on your CV. This is one thing I regret the most for not learning an extra, like a useful language. So I'm actually planning to learn French. So depends on where your interest is in and then decide whether you want to do an additional language. So I'll end my presentation here. Please feel free to ask questions during the Q&A session, type in the chat box. If it is a specific question directed to me, you can just type my name, but I'm more than happy if you just raise your hand and we can discuss as well. And if you have questions afterwards, please feel free to drop me an email or message me through LinkedIn. So I'll pass the time to May again, and thank you for your attention. 
thank you very much, Kuni. Um, as your teacher, I'm really happy to see your growth over the past one year. Excellent. Um, so, um, yes, uh, for all the participants, um, you can actually now drop your questions in the chat box and we will collect all your questions at the end and I will ask for you. Or if you want to ask for yourself, you can just click the raise hands at the end of the, um, of the talk. Um, so now we will have Ms. Karen Mao to speak to us and she is a public health practitioner and is now uh, working as an um, international specialist, UN volunteer at the WHO regional office for the Eastern Mediterranean. When she was in Hong Kong, she worked in the government and several NGOs focusing on policy research and advocacy, including health in action and the Hong Kong Council of Social Service. So now let's welcome Karen. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Hi. Karen. Uh, apologies, I was on a call with um, Geneva and Copenhagen colleagues because I am currently in Cairo, so um, in a work day, but apologies. Um, Never it's mind. very great to, to be here today. Um, it was I, I was actually like on, on one side, I was on the Zoom meeting. On the other side, I'm definitely tuning in. So, so it's been very exciting to hear from um, Joe and Queenie, especially because um, I've met a fellow UNV, Queenie. So I think it gives a very good context um, of the UN system and, and as well as UNV. So that would save a lot of you know, my time of um, sharing on the technicality. So, so what I think would be perhaps more useful would be um, I could focus perhaps a bit more on my personal experience and then perhaps validate a bit on what Queenie has shared because I think it's a good fit where Queenie shared um, on how you started off as a fresh graduate into the UNB system. And for me, I've been working for five, six years now. And then um, I joined as an international specialist as a UNB just two months ago. So I think that would be a good transition. Um, so let me share my screen. Let's see. Okay. Um, is it working? Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'm um, just very briefly again, thank you again for, for inviting. Um, and the topic today actually rings very close to, to what I'm very interested in because um, I actually started off working in the NGO sector before moving into government and then to, to the INGO sector. So um, I think every, um, everything today, like the speakers, would time very well. So I'm very looking forward to the Q&A especially. So I'll keep my session brief. Um, so again, rings very close to Queenie. So I'll talk a little bit about myself first, how I got here. Um, and then because the session is really about, you know, um, career sharing and it's about you. So I'll talk a bit about, you know, um, from my experience and my observations, what's out there, what is it for you, and hopefully some tips for, for you, um, no matter what's your interest area, where you want to go in the future. So I hopefully it's, it's more transferable and generic. Um, and I've just put a little disclaimer there that, you know, my views are expressed are solely my own and it doesn't represent any entity. So that's just a very um, governmental or I and you know, training. <laughs> So a few words about myself. So um, I've actually studied pharmacy um, at the University of Hong Kong. And um, similarly, I think um, at the universities in Hong Kong, COHK, HKU, other universities, I think a good opportunity is always um, as a student to join or take any opportunity that would, would open your eyes. So um, specifically um, going overseas, so for me, I've actually been to India for a service trip on um, women empowerment and I'm working in slums. And that was what got me <laughs> into the field of global development and, and global health, because to me, um, I've always been interested in health, but um, with this experience, I realized that the world is really big. So the other thing that I've always been thinking of was that there's a lot of worthy battles in this world, in Hong Kong, outside of Hong Kong, you know, gender equality, environmental science, human rights, animal rights. So I, I, I agree with, with what Joe and Queenie said. Um, it takes time to explore and to see where your interests lie, but, but eventually there are so many things out there and so many worthy battles that you'll, you'll find something. Um, and I really believe that you, you just listen to what your heart tells you and then everything will fall into place. So, so that's sort of my few words 
Um, so how I got here, so I mentioned that I um, was a pharmacist graduate and then because I was very interested in global health. So I did a global health master's um, in London after my internship at, at the um, hospital authority in Hong Kong. And interestingly, after my master's, I actually had a reverse of plan. So um, during my master's there, because we, um, we learned a lot about you know, ethics, social justice, it was quite a, um, an inspiring session for me because I, I came from a very physical science, health sciences perspective. And during my master's, we learned a lot about you know, anthropology, social sciences, different paradigms. And um, it was then when I realized that I had to reflect on my intentions of why I didn't, I wanted to do um, global development work. Was it because of, I wanted the adventure? Was it the ego? Was it, was it for, you know, the excitement? And I felt like in order for me to contribute substantially um, in another context, I really needed to have some skill set. So I didn't want to land in, you know, um, recolonize a place and we, we would still call it. So I really wanted to build up skill sets that's useful um, to the local context. So that's why after my master's, I decided actually to return to Hong Kong, uh, my home city, and to uh, work a bit there, gain some experience, explore my interest. So when I got back, um, the NGO that I worked in is called Health in Action. Um, I'd encourage you to look it up. It's, it's a very nice organization. Um, so the project I worked on was, was on refugees and asylum seekers. So um, in line with what I was thinking, rather than me flying overseas where I don't speak the local language, um, actually in Hong Kong, there are a lot of you know, neglected communities that would really need um, assistance or support. Um, so refugees, asylum seekers is definitely one of the most marginalized groups in, in my opinion. Um, so I you know, started off with a refugee project and that itself was also very humbling um, and eye-opening. So, you would appreciate that in Hong Kong, um, even though the population is not that large, we have people um, coming in from, from really all over the world. So Yemen families, Somalis, um, Sri Lankans, so, so really all over the world. Um, and you know that's where I started to pick up some Arabic works, which is useful here. And after working in, in the NGO sector in terms of you know, service projects, we moved on to you know, advocacy and policy a bit. So we had a funding from Oxfam, um, uh, specifically working with COHK actually is a joint project where we looked at the um, health care access of working poor families in Hong Kong. So that was sort of, you know, my gradual shift, shift because when I, like, when I said um, I didn't really have a plan, so I just went with what my is that I fell into the area of policy you know, research and policy advocacy. And through that um, Oxfam project, uh, we had to, as deliverables, we had to, you know, do press releases, press conferences, um, write to the government and, and policy briefs and all that. So when I was doing a bit more on, you know, policy research, then um, we moved into the area where we started to, you know, attend LegCo meetings, um, you know, write position papers, and then focusing not just on refugees and asylum seekers, but also uh, local ethnic minorities in general. So with the organization, we shifted from a more um, service approach to a bit more on policy advocacy um, and you know, a more systemic approach. And that was also how I, I um, had a um, realization or, or personal reflection that in order to bring about you know, systemic changes or sustainable durable solutions, um, we really had to work with the government, with the states, um, you know, charities, NGOs, definitely important to, to you know, stick the boundaries, fill the gaps. You know, the government cannot provide for everyone. It's always needed. But to bring about you know, systemic change, I always feel like it's, it's a good bridge. So today we have like the NGO and the, the international organizations. I feel like with charity, uh, because we're very close to the ground, so we know what people we work with, their, their living experience, their insights, their concerns, worries. So that's where I feel like we can really bring their voices to... Um, like what Queenie said, it's a, not higher level, but perhaps a policy level. So that um, it would be really helpful on this note to personally to start off with working in perhaps a more you know, frontline or, or ground level work where you work with communities themselves. So you know their, um, you know, you know their living experience. And that with, with that insight, you bring into the policy arena. And, and I think that is really valuable because once I've left the NGO and I started working in, in the government, I felt like what was um, really helpful is to have that insight in the, 
front ground. So when you start, because with um, policy work, it's a lot about, you know, papers, meetings, um, draftings, meetings again. And it, it could be easy to lose sight of what's happening in the ground. So either um, you have, you know, good networks, good partners. So you have to have some mechanism or means of communication, channels, bridges to keep yourself grounded. Um, so that's how, you know, I, I would think it is a good balance between, you know, working perspectives. So after, you know, NGO, I mentioned I, I joined the government as a policy analyst um, at the Policy Innovation and Coordination Office at the um, Hong Kong government. So that itself was an interesting role as well because it's, it's a new unit and um, it's, it's sort of a new try of the Hong Kong government to um, work across silos. So like, again, in line with um, SDG, sustainable development, we realize a lot of areas are not bounded by you know, policy uh, categories. They're all cross-linked. So with, with PECO, um, that's the Policy Innovation and Coordination Office. So we try to work across policy bureau. So because of my background, so well, some of the projects that I worked most um, involved in were in, in the health policies and welfare policies, and we had to coordinate across you know, different units. So um, one of the projects I worked on was around advanced directives where um, in, in the hospital. So to, um, to legislate advanced directives and with advanced directives, which means like um, before you become, for example, um, comatose or unconscious, you sign a paper to say that in case I become comatose, then I might want to you know, refuse life-sustaining treatment and, and, and all that. So we had to work with, interestingly, the fire services department because you know, they're the first port of call when you call 999. Um, we had to work with the, the um, DOJ, so the Department of Justice, um, of course, the um, Health Bureau, Food and Health Bureau, so, so across different stakeholders. So again, um, I think working in the government was a very, very valuable experience um, because coming from a civil society, you know, activist kind of point of view, it's easy for, you know, civil society to, to throw things out there. So, so one of the insights is that um, once you start to think from the policymaker's point of view, then I think it helped refine the proposals that you, um, you recommend to the government because in that way you would address some of their concerns. Um, for example, uh, a lot of what the government sometimes would think, um, some of their buzzwords would be read across implications, um, whether there's precedence, discretion. So once you have these you know, concepts in mind, then whatever proposal you propose um, would be hopefully more um, appropriate to the context and more likely to be considered. So again, that was an insight I got from, from the government. Um, on this note, I never thought I would work in the government, so, so never say never. Um, so with the government experience, um, I, so it was around like five years that I've um, graduated back then. So I felt perhaps I was ready to see whether I would return to my original you know, um, area of interest where I wanted to work in global development and global health. So I started looking for opportunities um, and I came across the UND opportunity to work at EMRO. So the photo here is actually, I think it was my first or second day leaving work at EMRO. So um, at WHO, maybe I could give a brief you know, introduction. I think Queenie uh, was very good that um, she introduced UNDP and UNB, so I'll skip that. Um, so from the WHO side, um, especially with COVID, I'm sure everyone <laughs> probably um, knows a lot more compared to even for myself one year ago. So um, there are three levels in, in the UN system and with WHO as well. So we have the headquarters in Geneva, and then we have the regional offices across six regions, and then we have country offices. With WHO, we have country offices in over 150 um, countries. Um, and the level that I'm currently placed is the regional office. So I'm at the Eastern Mediterranean regional office, um, abbreviated as EMRO. Um, within EMRO, um, we are situated in Cairo. And um, so this is the Cairo sunset. <laughs> and uh, we look at 22 countries in our region. And um, I think interestingly, our region, um, I think would, I, I would personally think um, would need all the help they can get. So a lot of war-torn countries are here. So Syria, Yemen, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Sudan are in a region. And the two polio endemic countries, um, Afghanistan and Pakistan as well, when we talk about polio eradication is also uh, in our region. So in terms of um, the geopolitics and, and the you know, cultural context, I think it's a very dynamic region. 
And when Queenie mentioned, I, I agree very absolutely that um, no matter which background you're from, so um, so Queenie might know more, you know, on your know, public policy side. I come from a very health background, but I think that no matter you want to work in international NGOs or even in Hong Kong, I feel like it's very important to understand historical context and um, political context because because we're all situated um, in in sort of you know, um, the wider society. So the policies that we you know, propose work on um, is always embedded in society. So so I'm reading a lot on you know Middle East history and everything, but I, but I feel it's very important to um, to have that knowledge in mind. Um, I'm aware that I'm taking a lot of time in this part, so I'll speed up. And the other little anecdote, because, you know, COHK mentioned that, oh, we have little anecdotes you could share with our participants today. And so we have um, masks. So to walk the talk, so uh, we're very, you know, cautious and um, you know, serious about mask wearing. So this is like version one of our Embro mask. So, so they keep actually making different kinds of you know, masks. So some of the interesting dialogues I've been having with my colleagues is to have like mass exchanges in terms of sharing the different types of masks we have. So from Hong Kong, because the Hong Kong government has that CU mask um, that the government officials wear a lot. So I've been sharing it with my colleagues and then they're also sharing their you know, masks from you know, Lebanon, you know, UK, everything. So, so it's an interesting time to be at WHO during COVID, but I also think it's, it's more relevant. Um, and, and I feel like partnerships, um, it's, it's really like a solidarity because we really are in this together. So, so um, yeah, there's a lot to talk about. So maybe if anyone's particularly interested in the experience, we could share more in the Q&A, but I'll be moving on from now from this part. Um, so the second part would be briefly, so what is out there? For you, so I would assume that um, our participants today who've joined the session are probably interested in, in NGOs and international organizations a bit more. Um, so it's great that again, Queenie has done like a brief introduction of the UN, but again, definitely the UN system is, is really huge. So here is the um, latest organizational chart in the public domain. Um, it's, it's a huge you know, entity. Um, a lot of different you know, organizations. So there is different names. So for example, WHO is called a specialized agency. Um, for example, the UNICEF is called a fund. Um, but basically there is uh, lots of different you know, entities and different types of work. So, uh, so some of them are really focused on you know, groundwork like um, UNHCR, they run refugee camps, they deliver you know, services. Um, with, with WHO, we're more on actually a normative and technical side. So we support country um, ministries of health, especially, um, you know, developing guidelines, providing support they need. So, so depending on which agency and your area of interest, there, there's a lot to explore. Um, so definitely check out the different agencies. And, you know, some of them probably, especially if we're from Hong Kong, because we don't really have UN agencies offices here, might be quite new. So definitely have a look. It, it's, it's very interesting. Um, so this is one of the you know, themes that um, from a personal point of view, I wanted to really share with participants today. Um, one of the recurring you know, themes or, or insights that I really had so far throughout my um, brief career is that you know, from quoting Alexander Fleming, um, who discovered, not invented, but discovered the penicillin, like the pharmacist side of me <laughs> coming in, is that one sometimes finds what one is not looking for. So the story very briefly of penicillin was that it was a mistake. So it was left, you know, overnight, and then there was some mold, and then um, they found out that it actually had, you know, antibiotic properties. So, you know, the, the lesson being that sometimes, you know, we, we come across, you know, um, opportunities, um, you know, people, experiences, work outside of work, where sometimes we, we can never really plan ahead, but, you know, um, stay open-minded and, and uh, keep an eye out for different opportunities. And sometimes that's how you would, you know, um, you know find your own path. So just a little quote there. Um, when, when I sometimes think about you know, exploring my career and the opportunities out there, um, again, I would very briefly share, I think, two very useful public health frameworks. I, I would think they're useful career frameworks, to be honest. So, so the one on the left is called the social determinants of birth. So for example, when I think about health, um, it's not just health care. So it's not just about you know hospitals, um, nurses, doctors, but it's really about you know the conditions, the systems, you know everything in place that makes people healthy, you know healthy physically, mentally, and socially. So with this framework and in public health, we we think about 
all the um, sectors and, and processes that that's there. Um, so, for example, when we talk about, you know, um, improving well-being, you know, that's that's often what you know, NGOs and international NGOs um, have as, as their vision. Um, it, it's a lot. So it's about related to education, you know, employment. Um, conditions, water sanitation, you know, housing, especially for Hong Kong, um, we have Tong Fong, you know, subdivided units, um, food, and then social networks, um, and you know, the general economic and cultural, you know, conditions. So, uh, so I would think that there, there's really a lot to explore. And when you map this, so, so we have actually done some of these exercises with some of my other students. And um, when we map this framework into the, um, for example, the governments departments or for example the NGO landscape in Hong Kong it maps very well so like we would always you know be able to find a specific NGO or an INGO sector where it fits into this so I think it would be helpful as a start to explore your um, your interest and the other um, is it, we call it like the the river analogy it's like the upstream downstream it's, it's quite common in, in development world especially for health looking at the type of intervention um, you're in so starting from for example for myself um, I started off at a very a rather downstream you know interventive Base where I, I mentioned I work with refugees. So we actually had even um, had to organize dental health camps because refugees um, aren't allowed to work in Hong Kong because we haven't signed the refugee convention. So, so there are certain um, immediate needs that have to be filled. And then moving a bit upwards, we started looking at you know, policies, instruments, um, you know, looking at system factors. So that's a bit more you know, upstream. And then even more upstream, you might be from, from, my, from my refugee example, it would be to thinking about why are there people actually you know, leaving their countries, coming to different places. Um, so, so I would think like the, the river analogy is, is a nice um, framework, again, to think of what intervention phase you might be interested in, for example, starting your career or moving upwards and downwards. And then so, so that's sort of you know, how I envision the opportunities um, out there and the different entities. Again, um, if anyone's like, interested in particular areas, we're happy to share more in the Q&A session. Um, and moving on to the last part on the useful tips, you know, hopefully I have come up with, I think, six I, I forgot how many Queenie had. <laughs> so six useful tips, hopefully, that um, it's it's based on you know my own um, experience when I was you know, doing job seeking interviews, you know, talking to people. So it's it's really you know, personal. So it not, might not be <laughs> applicable to everyone, but I just wanted to put it out there. So the first one rings very closely to to my role with the UNB with Queenies as well is volunteering. Uh, we even with Joe well, with everybody. But volunteering is, is so important, well, not just um, because of the value in itself, but but again, to me, it's it's really because um, there are so many different types of living experience. Like we as one human being, you're not able to live all the experience, but it's through engaging with you know different communities, different people's lives. Um, that's when you really you know build relationships and understand the the context and and the needs of different communities and it's it's really through that personal you can read a lot of course on that but it's really through you know, one on one conversations being out there um, that you you really understand the context so volunteering is really useful and I would just add that apart from because of COVID I understand but even outside of COVID there are so many forms of volunteering so you don't have to be physically there um, UNV actually has an online platform so definitely check it out. Um, I also did one of the online UNB sessions as well, so that would also be a good start um, to start engaging with you know, NGOs and, and the UN system. Um, and the second tip I had was, um, it's, it's interesting, so um, as you start considering how you want to you know, develop your career, I think a, a useful way is to look at JD, so job descriptions of positions that are posted, because in, in the JDs, we would list out um, the requirements in terms of you know, education, uh, work experience, for example, language, um, you know, technical skills, everything. And when you look at positions that you might envision yourself you know, working in five years, 10 years time, you would know the things, the skills, the education that you might want to start acquiring. So it's okay to look at jobs, you know, like 20 years experience and not for me now, but no problem. Look at it and then see what they're um, looking for so that you can start building up your own profile. So look at JDs, that is definitely helpful. Um, the third tip is it's very simple. It's subscribe to newsletters. 
um, subscribe to, to Joe's organization, to, to um, organizations that you're interested in, um, because I, I found it very helpful because I subscribe to all the news um, newsletters and you know, Twitter, LinkedIn pages of organizations I'm interested in because that's sort of you know how um, they put things out there. You know how the what the what work these organizations are currently on. Um, you know any new areas, so it's it's useful to to be on you know um, on the updates of what what organizations are up to right now. Um, so that's a very simple and useful tip. So. Um, I, I realize a lot of, you know, in Hong Kong, maybe we don't use newsletters that much, but um, across, you know, organizations out of Hong Kong, it's really how people connect and, and communicate. So that's a um, simple but useful tip. And then the next one, um, it's, it's really to encourage you to reach out to working professionals. So reach out to, to Joe, to Queenie, to, to everyone, um, because I'm sure that, to be honest, like people who... Um, who are very interested and passionate about their work wouldn't mind you, you know, reaching out to them uh, and then sharing more um, because, you know, even, even today, I, I would really hope that you know, everyone here would be able to find what they're, you know, passionate in. Um, and then it's, it's sort of a, um, a helping community, I think. So definitely reach out to people who you think their profile are interesting or you're interested in either their work, their organization, um, even, you know, how they got through interviews, anything. So I think that would be really useful. Um, and then also to start building up some of the you know, connections in, in the development or, or NGO field as well. Um, you know, in, in Hong Kong, sometimes people say, oh, it's connections, how you get a new job, but I don't see it as negatively because I feel like um, in, in the networks that you will start building up, it's really people who have similar maybe values um, and interests. So it's, it's a helping community. So, so I think it's, it's, it's good to you know, meet people, like-minded people in Hong Kong, outside of Hong Kong, and start having these conversations. Um, I think the fifth, the fifth tip I had up there is, is to be out there. So it resonates a bit with, with the um, volunteers that I, I was talking about. Um, again, I understand it's COVID times, but it's, it's still helpful to keep this in mind. I mean, with Zoom, everything, it's easier to connect. Um, because it's it's easy to you know search endlessly online, Google, read things, but it's really different when you're out there. Um, it's it's not just about whether it's it's the same experience or not, but but a lot of the things aren't actually available online. Um, for example, especially sometimes with NGOs, we have like a new project, we want someone to help us quickly or anything. We don't intentionally not put an opportunity out there. It's just because you know we don't have the time. It's 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 easier if we reach out to people we know or have a network and then start it off from there. So ringing to the reaching out to professionals, um, being out there and to know um, what's happening on the ground is, is really helpful. So definitely be online and offline as well, um, as much as you can, um, so that you'll be able to know what opportunities are out there. Um, and the final tip, really easy, is, is to read. You know, Irrespective of what I said about being out there, I still think it's really important to, to read a lot. Um, and to read widely, um, so not just your own area, but really to, to you know, be, be open-minded. So just the very, very final note about um, probably what NGOs, INGOs, or actually any, I think um, employers these days are look for is to really have, you know, diverse, it's not just skills gets, but a diverse um, knowledge or, or a diverse awareness of what's happening around the world, because I think we're moving a bit from traditionally perhaps a more vertical uh, specialist approach towards a more you know, horizontal integrated approach. So I, I think, um, for example, for me, I've moved on for you know, NGO, government, non-government, but I think um, that that's really how I think the world, the trend is going. So don't be you know, afraid if you feel like, oh, I'm not specializing in an area. Specialization, of course, it's so useful, but I don't think there's any problem with being a generalist and sometimes it's just different skill sets. So um, maybe I'll stop here and then I'm looking for the Q&A. So thank you so much. Oh, my last quote, sorry. So life plans are an illusion. So have a life philosophy that will guide you in your career. So don't panic if you feel like you don't have a plan. Um, just you know, follow your values and everything will be fine. Um, and so good luck with, with your careers and thank you so much for inviting again. And um, feel free to be in touch with LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, very useful tips. Um, so now, um, 
So now uh, we'll have Professor Annie Tam, Chairman of the Executive Committee of New Life Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association to share her experience with us. Annie is a former administrative officer who has just retired from the Hong Kong Civil Service with her last position as the Permanent Secretary for Labor and Welfare. She has served in the government for over 36 years with postings of leading and important positions. And she has rich experience in policy formulation and working with different parties, including NGOs, to improve social wealth welfare. And Annie is also a registered social worker and a CHK alumna, and is now serving as an honorary professor of Faculty of Social Science at CHK. In today's seminar, um, in addition to some work experience, Annie will also provide us with some theoretical concepts about corporate governance and NGOs. Let's welcome Annie. Sarah, Andy, you can now unmute. Yes, I'm. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sharing the screen. I'm a little bit uh, 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 worried that I may not be able to do so because I'm not technically competent, as always. We can see the screen. Perfect. Okay, can I say, okay thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, May, for having invited me to this webinar. I really like it topic called careers in NGOs and international organizations and work for social good. And actually on the international organization, I've learned a lot from Queenie and Karen, which are very new to me. Those, uh, those uh, NGO, AI NGOs uh, are very new to me, although I learned a little bit from the paper. Now today I will focus on the local NGOs. Now, let me see if I can move the slides. Okay. Now, why we're here, I'm, of course, this is why we are here. I, I would focus on the local NGOs as Karen and uh, Queenie has already talked a lot about the international NGOs. So I understand that a lot of uh, students are attending this webinar in order to understand the job nature, required skill in the daily operation of the NGOs and prepare themselves of how to serve in the NGOs in different capacities. Since the two speakers already declared they, in, they uh, introduced themselves, I better declare my interest that this is the first thing that we will need to do whenever we attend an NGO meeting. Okay. Now, I personally, uh, uh, May has already introduced my past experience. I'm talking about more the current local NGO experience. I'm involved in 10 local NGOs in Hong Kong and include of course, the New Life Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association, which I'm the chairperson. And I devoted a lot of time to this voluntary work. And then I'm also involved in a lot of youth work because I'm very interested in the youth work in Hong Kong. So you will see that I'm, I'm working in a number of youth NGOs, including some which are specialized in, for example, residential service for girls who cannot come to live with their families. And also I've been involved in two educational institutions, the Donghua College, as well as the Hong Kong Youth Space Alumni. And two, in, two other very specialized, one is the Hong Kong Housing Society, which I will touch upon, as well as the Hong Kong Breast Cancer Foundation. As a woman, I'm, I'm not a survivor, but I was somehow involved in this Breast Cancer Foundation. And I think that this is a very useful and meaningful work that I can get myself get involved into. Okay, as May has said, I was, in, I was involved a little bit in the academic side, and this is my famous or, or very usual slide that I would introduce my policy in order to understand a little bit about the interaction between the society and the NGO sector with the government. Of course, the NGO sector is very important, it's part of the society. Um, of course, I noticed that Joe called NGOs no, no longer as NPOs, but call yourself for impact, which I fully appreciate the reasons. But uh, it's still very common in Hong Kong to equate NGOs with NPOs. So I still use the older term of NGOs, NPOs, and also social enterprise, of course, is uh, one of the so-called social innovation way, innovative way of uh, in, uh, having some impact on the society. So the interaction between the society, particularly the NGO sectors, as well as the government, in order to meet social needs and then the ongoing interaction to meet the social needs will generate policies. 
And we will, there were, of course, the context that some of the speakers have been talking about. So today, the focus is on the NGOs or NPOs or for impact organizations, as Joe has mentioned. Okay. Now, I would, because of the time limit, I will not go to the definition of the NGO, but as a, you know, a part-time lecturer, we always want to start with the, some definition of what is NGOs, but students can go to the website or other websites to look at what is the definition of NGOs. But basically, I myself will use it very loosely as to mean organizations which operate independently of the government, despite that those NGOs may receive funding or support from the government, but they operate independently of the government. Now, of course, then the most NGOs in Hong Kong are actually uh, incorporated under the company ordinance. And they call themselves private companies, including the New Life Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association, which I'm now saying. And some, of course, are statutory. So most of the NGOs in Hong Kong are actually following the company structure. And, and, and incorporate under the company ordinance. But we all managed to get the Section 88 status, which means that we're exempted by the uh, Commission of Inland Revenue from paying tax and in recognition of our charitable work. So normally, Section 88 status is very important for local NGOs in Hong Kong in order to gain the general recognition that we are doing charitable work. And most NGOs are doing community work. Now, I used, they also need to uh, interact with the government on a continuing and ongoing basis and involve in the government's governance as well as politics. Now, I will quote examples since a lot of uh, speakers have been talking about the social welfare side. I'm, I'm a registered social worker, and therefore I will talk about, I will use the example. There are many NGOs in Hong Kong, but one of the group of NGOs are doing welfare. And most of them become members of the Hong Kong Council of Social Service, I think which Karen has worked with for a while, if I heard it correctly. And then according to the CEO who had recently came to talk to the students, he said that there are over, he said that there's over 490 agency members and about 3,000 operating agents. So there are quite a big group of NGOs working on the welfare side. Now, what is corporate governance is basically, I will not show the video because of the time limit, but basically governance is now a very fashionable term. Now we're talking about from government to governance. And of course, we are also talking about corporate governance of the NGOs, particularly for those subventor NGOs who have received funding from the government or from Jockey Cup or other sources. People expect that to be accountable for the political resources. So if students are interested in this topic about corporate governance, they can refer to my video or other videos available so that they have an understanding of corporate governance. Now, in my lecture, I will cover a full lecture on corporate governance, so I don't have time for this. Now, the importance of local NGOs to have governance is already highlighted in the ICAC's best practice checklist, is that because we receive also public funds and we have a public accountability issue. And the issue about good governance is always close to the heart of the NGO. So don't, this is one of the areas that we have, NGO has to work very hard into. One of my missions of working in the New Life Association, I will make my pledge that in my following years, I will work on wholly the gov corporate governance as well as a professional government, the services. That's all I want to do. So, and of course, government, the Hong Kong SL government is very interested to getting good governance, particularly for the subventor organizers. So the issue a guide for students who are interested in the corporate governance, they can look into this guy. I've given you the website link. And then the, 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 reason, the key principles of good corporate governance as outlined by this guy is to focusing on your purpose and the outcomes for the citizens and uh, service users perform clearly and effectively in your functions and roles and promoting values, as well as taking informed, transparent decisions and managing risks, developing the capacity and the capability of the board to be effective. The board normally means a governing board or engaged stakeholders and making accountability a real issue. Now, students who are interested in the corporate governance will have to look into the model or other models. This is the model the government advocated in doing it. So the most important part you can see is the components is the board. The board is normally called the board of directors or called executive committee in some of the NGOs, which is the governing board. So I won't go into issues about the corporate governance, but this is my own, I, my own list of corporate governance issues, at, at least for my NGOs, which I'm now chairing in your life, I'm going to focus in on this list of issues in order to ensure that the corporate governance is working well. So um, 
but I don't, I, I don't have time uh, today, so I won't go through it, but I just give the students my list of corporate governance issues. And to me, I will always summarize the success factor of NGO or NPO governance or impact for impact governance is this five LM eight hours. This is my belief and my faith. So I, I think that NGO have to get the locus right, the logic right, the logistics right, and have a little bit of luck and have to love your, your job. You have to really believe what you have doing in order to get it done. It makes a big difference if you don't believe in what you're doing and you're doing it. I think the three speakers have this experience themselves. They, they will agree with me. I'm very glad that Joey is nodding in her head and maybe very encouraged because I really believe that love makes a lot of difference. And therefore I have eight hours. You have to be right people, right time, right place, right attitude, right strategy and be responsible, responsive and be respectable. This is always very important to me. And originally I have nine hours. I always have to say right heart. But one of my members say that right heart is not the right thing to do from the medical point of view. So I delete that from the list. Now, I go a little bit before the students decided to go to work or serve in NGOs in different capacities. It's, you have to understand what is an NGO's function. Now, normally, NGOs have two main functions. One is advocacy and one is operational. So on the advocacy side, I will not spend time today because if students are really interested, the United College is very generous in agreeing to share an interview video which the students themselves, a group of my students interviewing the CEO of Hong Kong Council of Social Service, Mr. Choi Hawaii, just a few days ago. And Mr. Choi talked a lot about the advocacy part and how he actually engaged the so-called advocacy through practicing strategy of Hong Kong CSS. And also, the, some of the topics, uh, some of the issues which the previous speakers have been talked about have been covered by, by Mr. Choi, for example, housing, subdivided units, Poverty Nine. For example, he talked about how he has the Hong Kong Council of Service and the voluntary sector as a whole has been fought more than 10 years in, that, in order to get the government agreeing to formulate the poverty line. And also other issues, so for example, how we agree to help the disability people and things like that. And also he was doing something like a transitional housing. And this is a very interesting project, which he thought that there is something that is done to assist to to change the world and solve social problems with social innovation. Of course, the definition he used is the Young's Foundation's definition on social innovation, which students can refer to. So that interview would be very interesting. If, if your students are interested in that, we can share the video with you because uh, the United College say that they, we can do so. You, and then, of course, I, I, I personally agree with Mr. Choi, most of the words I said, but I would like to, for the students who actually study data and technology, they probably would like to know how they can integrate the conventional techniques of advising, lobbying, advocacy, and activism in order to influence the government's policy by innovation and data. Using the data analysis, technology, and innovation and creative solutions, which you have learned from your course and acquired from your IT or innovation courses, in order as the field to help you to do something new, such as you said, your own NGOs, work in NGOs, to have something with the social enterprises or doing some other social innovation work, or even doing social analysis and research and advocacy. Now, Mr. Choi believes that nowadays we should uh, practicing uh, advocate by practicing, which I also agree. If you want to make impact, you have to experience new policy and lead the government into the policy directions that you want, or moreover, create a social value, co-create a social value with the society, so the government will have no reason of not adopting what you are advocating, because that is already the social value that the community has adopted. So um, that would create the impact, which I think Joe would be very interested in. Now, I'll choose two examples to illustrate how students or people in Hong Kong or elsewhere can contribute to NGOs, to serve NGOs in different capacities. I, I deliberately choose two local NGOs knowing that Queenie and uh, Karen has covered uh, the international NGOs. I choose two diff extremely different ones. One is the Hong Kong Housing Society and the other one is the New Life Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association, which are, both of them are close to my heart. 
Now, Hong Kong Sea Society may be very new to some of the students, who are, particularly for those students who are not working on the construction side. They are basically a very old organization that started up in 1948. Their, their main objective is to help the government to solve the housing problem. Okay, and because the government is basically doing the public housing side, and therefore they are trying to do something which the government cannot do. And so now they basically is a housing laboratory. So they, they managed to do a number of things in the main schemes, which I talk about rental housing, rural public housing, urban improvement scheme, fret for fret scheme, sandwich car scheme, full market value development, urban renewal projects. Now, the interesting thing is about they actually can manage to do something which the government cannot do, and nobody in the government is doing, like the elderly housing. For example, they have therefore they have their elderly housing projects, like the senior citizens' residence scheme, subsidized self-fest schemes for this, what they call SEN schemes, the Tenor Hill project, and some of the social projects which they are working with the NGOs in order to improve the lives of the elderly, particularly the elderly residents living in the estates. Now, putting in my ship, the housing society is part of the, the community, and they are trying to do a bridge between the government and private housing in order to resolve the housing problem. So they're trying to, they're trying to experiment, as they say, that they advocate through practicing, and therefore they call themselves the housing laboratory. So one of the things, this is the mission and value and, uh, table. Every NGO has to be guided by the mission and vision. Mission is what they are doing. Mission is what they are aiming to do in a long time, in a longer term. And value are those things that they believe that are those are things which drive the mission and the value. Now, because of the vision and mission, because it was a big organization dealing with housing issues in Hong Kong, they have a very complicated corporate structure. This is what, if you're talking about governance, the corporate structure is the first thing, because you look at the guideline, they will always tell you you should have a board. In this one, they have a two-tier one. They have an executive committee and a supervisory board and many subcommittees, and then with the CEO and the executive director with a team working to that. If students are interested, they should be looking at what the CEO and the team are doing in order to see whether they can find a job which they are interested in doing in serving this sort of organization. Now, so I tell you, if you look at those things, like what are they doing? They're doing planning issues, they're doing finance, they're doing IT, they're doing human resource development, they are doing, of course, construction and development, and they are trying some interesting projects like elderly services, and also some maintenance. So depending on the students' ex areas of expertise, you can choose an area of work that suits your interest. If you're interested in social projects, you can talk about elderly health services and other social projects which they are doing. For example, they're doing about promoting mental health of the elderly uh, residents in their estates. If you're interested in, for example, IT, you can work in that. They actually provide them some IT interns for students. If you are interested in doing something planning or doing something very innovative or helping the organization to do something about the corporate structure or doing something innovatively, then you can join their so-called business innovation team in order to give your ideas of how to do it. But if you're really, really very technical, then you should try the internship and do some, for example, IT and data collections or research teams. Of course, if you're really liking to do ministry ticket, they also have a division of taking minutes and train you to be very good in serving committees. Okay, so they have a number of jobs there, although it's a big organization, but the number of staff they have is 1,368 as an end of the financial year. And then, of course, you can talk, there are a diversity of jobs that you can do. Uh, you can, you can, you can uh, join their chief executive officer's office to do some really policy making work or trying some internship on helping to do policy making, or you can do corporate planning, or you can join some development projects or trying to do, take care of the data collections and, and, and research. And very interesting, some universities like Hong Kong University, the University of Hong Kong are helping them to do some of the research. You can also help sponsor, uh, help supervising them. Now that is a big organization. I'm turning to a very, very, specialized organization, that's New Life Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association. We do not have a grand history. We, we start very humbly as a mutual aid group 
of a psychiatric doctor taking care of their patients. And then after the patients have been discharged from the hospital, they have nowhere to go. And therefore, the doctor decided to have a mutual aid group with them. We start with some residential service, very humble, humble cottages, and also a farm in Tibu in order to give them some jobs to do. That started a residential service and vocational service. And gradually, we experiment new schemes. New Life is very famous of doing evidence-based practices. And in order to lead uh, the rehabilitation, psychiatric rehabilitation side to new areas, like the IC, uh, like some community, in, integrated community service centers, which was something experiment by the New Life before it was recognized by the government. So we have, we, it's a moderate uh, uh, organization, but we are very devoted to only one thing, that is psychiatric rehabilitation. So we have a very, a range of services like vocational, clinical professional psychologists, family self support, public education, residential service, community service, service for children and the parents or with autism children. This is a very interesting area we are expanding. And we serve about 96,000 uh, six, uh, 96, uh, people every year. Now, that's what we are serving. The part chart, the part chart at, the, at the, the second one is what we're trying. We are still serving many uh, seriously mentally ill people, like people with schizophrenia and um, at psychosis, but we are, there are increasing trend of people having other disorders like anxiety disorders and depression orders, which we are trying to help, like eating orders, sleep orders, which are aware of mood disorder that we are trying. So I'm a little bit curious why the stress has been such an impactful subject in, in Hong Kong to make some, so many people now suffering from mental disorder and also some other mood disorders, particularly under COVID. This is something that the, our association is working very hard on. And of course, there are a number of jobs. If people are interested, there are a number of jobs that you can do. If you are a social worker, of course, you are all welcome to, to work in our residential services of different types and also vocational services. We have a shelter workshop, we have assisted support schemes, and we have a number of interested projects. And also, if you are interested in community service of talking to people and helping the people in the community to make sure that, that their mental health is going well or helping them to solve their mental health problems, then you can focus on our community service. If you're a clinical psychologist, of course, you are very welcome to join us. We have a strong team of clinical psychologists. And of course, if you are doing other things, we, are, we need things like human resource, uh, people, we need people good at finance, we need people good at IT. I have colleague, colleague here who will make sure that my IT going very well. So we are, we have all sorts of this supporting people with a lot of people who support us administratively and also to help us to do our public education work. So if you are really creative, IT wise or Zoom wise or just paper writing, you can always join our creative team to help us to do the community services promotion. Now, th this is an expanding area. Unfortunately, mental health and psychiatry is an expanding area. You can see that there are many applications waiting for admission to the service, and we do not have enough service quotas. So this is an expanding area. We're looking for young people, looking for young people to join us. And, uh, and New Life Focus is one of the NGOs who start up with social enterprise. Our social enterprise is called WISE. It's not because we are very wise, it's because it's what integrated social enterprise. And of course, people know that social enterprise is different from private companies in that our social mission is most important. It's all equally important to the business goals. And therefore, we are focusing on helping those people who have mental problems when they recover or in the world of recovery, they go back to work either in, in our association, in either supporting our employment, or eventually we hope that they can go back to the open employment. Now we leverage on, we are a small organization, but leverage on a food chain, a vertical food chain in order to do the social enterprise. So we have catering, we have retail, we have direct services, we have tourism and property management. 
And you can see this brand, even in the Chinese University of Hong Kong, this is called 330. Many people have misunderstood with this 360 or 340 or whatever. It's just 330. 340, for those people who are familiar with Cantonese language, who understand it's sun something. That means it's body, mind, and spirit. So um, this is our brand. And therefore, we have Cafe 330 in the Chinese University of Hong Kong and Hong Kong in China, the University of Hong Kong. We have Farm Fresh, we have, and we have Yi Kultur, and we have the brand of Yes, which is the red, black, and uh, red, red, and the blue skin. So this is a blend of our social enterprises and equal to us. So I just, because of the timing, I, don't, I won't go into details of that. The, 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 actually, students were interested in our social enterprise. We're doing some business work as well as to do, we're serving a mission, and you do not want to go to the private companies, do consider social enterprise. There, there are many NGOs like New Life operating NG, uh, social enterprise. We have to balance the part business objective with the social objective in order to uh, handle the double bottom line. And of course, under COVID, it is now we, are, we have to subsidize a little bit about the social enterprise, about one million every year nowadays. But hopefully we have the situation we go better, and then our social enterprise will be able to balance the social objectives and business objectives better. Now, I use my ship to uh, explain the interaction between the Hong Kong, between the new life and the government. We're doing mental health, we support the government's two-plan policy. We serve those people who have the need. We also talk to the community in order to help the community people to prevent themselves from falling into problems, and also we have other things that we are interested in. We are like to sell financing services that we are interested in, and also some subvented services and some service supported by Jockey Club. Jockey Club is a good partner of us. They normally support us very voluntary in order to experiment new things for new projects for the government to take over. So we have a long-term relationship with them. So we also do mindfulness and peer support. And also we believe in recovery. A, a scheme. So we also do recovery action plan, things like that. And we basically believe in the recovery model in Hong Kong. We were one of the organizations in Hong Kong who championed the uh, application of recovery model in Hong Kong. This is our vision. Our vision is a long-term inclusiveness and equal opportunities of people suffering from mental problems. Uh, but our mission is to serve them with our two important values is care for people and, ex and search for excellence. Now, our structure is a normal NGO structure. Uh, we do not like Hong Kong Housing Society has a two tier. We have only one tier. The executive committee is the governing body. We have the chairperson as well as the directors. And then we have subcommittees to take care of them. And we have a small group of presidents and vice presidents who uh, help us to appoint the members of the executive committee and the CEO and staff. For students who are interested, of course, students can join us in the subcommittees as well as the executive committee. I will welcome them. I'm, I now have some professors sitting on them. I will welcome students if you're interested in joining one of my subcommittees to help me to do some of the work. You do come, let me know and self-nominate yourself. I'm sure that I will respond, okay? And if you are, you are not, you do not have the time yet, then and you want to have a career, then you look at what the CEO and the staff are going to do, okay? This is the chart which shows that what the CEO and the staff are doing. We, we blow up those divisions under the chief and under the CEO so that you know that the, the job opportunities, as I mentioned, then you, even if you are not a social worker, even if you are not a clinical psychologist, you can always find something interesting. For example, in an organization like the New Life Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association. So look at those areas. For example, if you are interested in working with people, you can talk about, you can do human resources. If you're really good at IT, you do IT. If you are doing, you are really good at creative things and you do creative. Uh, 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 promotion for us. So you can easily find something you are interested in. We have a 1,277 staff. So some of them are professional, some are frontline, some are supporting, some are administrative. You can see the percentage and see which one you are interested in. If you are interested, let me know. Okay. We recruit the staff from time to time. And we make sure that for those, some of the positions that our board of our executive committee members will sit on that to make sure that we select the right person. One thing you have to bear in mind, if you want to join New Life, my president has said this to me before he passed 
the chairmanship to win. She said that for New Life, I don't only want good people, good at their work, good at the profession. I also want people with a good heart. Okay, so if you have the good heart, do come to New Life because my president has already said that she wants people with good expertise as well as good heart. Okay, now so but if you don't want you 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 feel a little bit of time and you don't want to serve my committees and subcommittees, but you can also service our volunteers with a very 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 interesting volunteer program. Uh, you starting from the farm to the shelter workshop and also to uh, doing some mindfulness for a small group, many, many things that you can do for us. We welcome your ideas or working with the autistic children or the family that would be very interesting or, or, or doing some employment support work or counseling, or you try to learn how to do counseling work. We also provide that sort of training for uh, students who are interested in it. There are sometimes, we of course are cooperated with the universities in order to support their intern programs, but we do receive self-nominations of interns and, we, and we, we always entertain that. We have interns with us almost if whenever students want to come to do interns uh, for whatever reasons. If we think that they, we, they are something that are interesting, we always try to find something interesting for them to do so that they will have an experience in doing it. You can write to me directly if you are interested in the interns. Of course, you can support us, but, but supporting what we are doing. One of the things that we're doing is the day day surgery, or which you can all support us by just have to be taking care of yourself by having a micro break every day. What is a micro break? Is you, you break from what you, you have been doing, doing something that you like, and then you think, and then you, you're, we believe that the mental health will be better because we believe that there's something that is professionally reasonable, professionally sound. Like,我刚才的公园散步,散步的时候,say our students can support this by practicing the three, this micro break yourself. And then if you are interested, you can sign our charter to remind yourself to do it. For organizations like Joe's organizations, you can be our supporting organizations. You email me and then and then you we welcome you to be one of our supporting organizations. The MTRC, Cyberport, a lot of people, we have more about about 100 organizations. Uh, becoming our supporting organizations. So if you are interested, you let me know. For Queenie and Karen, you can sign our charter and practice something you like. And then I believe that your, your 330 will be much better. Okay. Now there are some of the events that we're doing. So if students have some ideas, do let me know. Then we can we can include them. We have recently do a K a what? a cooking exercise with a famous artist on how to promote review. There are some interesting uh, videos which you can find in our day day 330 setup. So I will conclude the, the um, slide by saying that, although I give a very rough background of some NGOs in Hong Kong, a couple of NGOs in Hong Kong, and I think students or actually people like myself can actually contribute to the NGO setup by, you can set up an NGO, a social enterprise, Actually, some of my students are going to set up an NGO. They, they told me that they're going to set up an NGO. And they, 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 and actually, there are some of my colleagues setting up a small NGO. On. One of my colleagues set up an NGO on storytelling to uh, deal with anti-stigmatizing of people with uh, on recovery. So it would be very interesting of setting up a small NGO. Social enterprise is a little bit risky, I tell you. Students may be interested in social enterprise, but you may lose money in it unless you, like New Life, like the COVID-19, we are subsidizing our social enterprise a bit. So social enterprise is a little bit adventurous, okay? 
And, and of course, you can be a volunteer, an intern, a trainee in an NGO center. If you're interested in housing society, you write to them or look at their website. They always have openings. If you're interested in new life, you, can, you write to me, okay? You can always support our mission. For example, join our 330, day day 330 uh, picture. So even if you are small, we are small, we can make a big picture. At least try. Actually, I have to acknowledge this come from one of, the, this slide come from, Apart the writing, come from one of my colleagues. I be, I'm a, I'm a faith, I have a lot of faith in kindness. I, and therefore, I always end up my presentation with this slide. Let the flower of kindness blossom in the heart. On this, I go back to you, May, and happy to answer questions at the Q&A.